Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for being with us this evening. It's a very, very special occasion, and I'm so delighted with my colleagues to welcome you all as we embark on a celebration. Well, we are calling it the 75th anniversary of our independence, but in a sense, our civilization stretches back to around 5,000 years. My name is Shubodip, and with my colleague Shukon Nahia, we will take you through the first phase of the evening, and then we will um, have some interesting turns of the event, which we shall, you know, which you shall witness. So, uh, without further ado, I'll give you a little bit of a background as to, you know, what we thought we should be bringing to you today and celebrate with all of you. In the year 1901, a poet in his late 30s um, published a poem called Prarthana, uh, which uh, came out in a magazine, in a journal called uh, Noi Beddo. And 12 years later, um, when he was awarded the, the Nobel Prize for Literature, the same poet, he um, translated that poem, which came out as poem number 35 in the anthology of his works, Gitanjali. And um, the translated version, he in fact, he himself translated the poem, and the translated version was called uh, An Indian Dream, An Indian Prayer, I'm sorry. And in Bengali, in the Bengali version, he um, sort of talked about India as a nation. And in the English translation version, which you all know of, it's more commonly known as where the mind is without fear and the head is held high. He finishes that poem with the phrase, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. What Rabindranath Tagore essentially, possibly um, thought of in his poem was as a prayer to the God, praying for true freedom for his country. And in the process, he possibly reveals his own concept of freedom throughout the poem. Now, at a very individual level, I mean, at a very, very mundane, basic level, we all have our own concept of what freedom means to us and uh, what is the inherent and subjective implication of freedom that is largely considered to be a corollary of independence. So when we thought of today's program, we thought of just not celebrating, you know, the 75th anniversary. But let us do that through the personal experiences of some people, and all of you are included in that, who sort of grew up when the nation was, you know, sort of just independent, started, you know, its own governance, and the same people, their professional journeys have converged with the journey of a modern and independent India. So that's what we thought of you know, bringing to you today. So today's narratives will be from those stalwarts who have carved out their own leadership stories from beginnings just like you and me, but significantly intertwined with the nation's progress as we have taken our rightful place in the world economic order. We wanted this evening to be personal and intimate, and we wanted each of us to take back with us as we go back home to our loved ones, memories which we can preserve 
and we hope that we spend this 90 odd minutes reminiscing, sharing, laughing hopefully, and learning from all of us within through our stories, insights, and leading thoughts for us to take back. We shall commence the evening with the national anthem presented by our own secretariat team from the Bengal Chamber. May I request you to please rise. Thank you. May I now request Mr. Abraham George Stephanos, President of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry, to please formally address you all and open the session. Sir. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And thank you all for joining us today and making this occasion even more special for us. August 15, 1947 is a landmark event in history and our people's collective memory as the day that India achieved independence. During the journey of the past 75 years, the rich history of Indian civilization and its cultural diversity have converged with the focus of a young, ambitious nation with globally recognized talents. India is now a brand of shared future and opportunities for achievement, progress, and prosperity for its billion plus citizens, making her a notable power to appreciate and collaborate with. The World Economic Forum had reported that India is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. By 2030, it is on course to witness a 4x growth in consumer spend. It will remain one of the youngest nations on the planet and will be home to more than 1 billion internet users. The new Indian consumer will be richer and more willing to spend with very specific preferences. It also says that India presents a host of exciting business opportunities in the next decade. As we can all see, our indigenous products are emerging as solutions for various needs globally. This in itself provides a basket of opportunities which can be harnessed by the very talented population that we have. As Swami Vivekananda said, this is the ancient land where wisdom made its home before it went to any other country. India, as a country with this legacy of knowledge, 
has the potential to be a global knowledge hub. With its youthful population and thriving information and communication technology industry, India can become a leading knowledge-driven economy as regulatory, educational, and infrastructure barriers are slowly getting removed. As a country, we need to significantly invest in health and education to leverage our demographic dividend. Skill development would be a game changer for today's India for her inclusive growth. And across the country, both at the center and the states, there are many initiatives that are targeted towards achieving this. In modern India, cities have emerged as engines of growth and opportunity. Sustainable urban solutions are needed to accelerate the growth. India's transition towards a nation that balances its energy needs with sustainability is crucial. The Bengal Chamber, as a responsible organization, has been working with various stakeholders, including business, government, and civic society, towards achieving a sustainable journey for the country's growth, a growth which is also inclusive and which acknowledges, acknowledges the diversity that we have. The greatest power India has is her resilience. This resilience has been manifested throughout her history and even in recent times. The recent pandemic may be cited as the latest case study. Resilience is the collective power of the country which percolates down at the level of every single individual. May this take our countries to greater heights, embracing empathy and the mantra of good for all. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. We shall move on to the next phase of the program immediately with a curated and moderated panel discussion on India at 75. When we conceived the idea of celebrating, uh, you know, this milestone year of our independence, the first thing that came to our mind was, let's try and listen to some, some of the people whose experiences can drive us towards knowledge, wisdom, and emancipation. So we approached one of our former presidents, Mr. Ambarish Das Gupta, with over 30 years of experience in consulting. Incidentally, he has a mastery of the world economy, polity, and contemporary issues to moderate the session. May I request Mr. Ambarish Das Gupta to please come up to the desk, sir. Our next two panelists are, again, two former presidents of the Bengal Chamber, Mr. Alok Mukherjee and Mr. Indrajit Sen, both of whom are perhaps two of the senior most former presidents of the chamber who had started their career when, the, when young India was truly young in every sense. <laughs> and uh, thereafter, they scripted their own stories in the corporate world, in academics, and thereafter, as the nation, you know, sort of put on age and wisdom, they also grew to, you know, heights. And even now, both of them are in service of not only the corporate world, but they are continuing to give to academics, to society, to civil society, and to institutions like the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry. May I request both Alok sir and Indrajit sir to please come up to the dais.
Our final panelist is someone who, you know, did something absolutely amazing. He joined Coal India Limited as a management trainee in the early 70s and rose to become its chairman and scripting one of the largest ever corporate IPOs the world has ever seen. Mr. Partha S. Bhattacharya, again, a senior, a former senior vice president of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry, who is mentoring and leading all our initiatives in the area of mining, metallurgy, sustainability, energy, you name it. Sir. I would request Mr. Ambarish Das Gupta to take the discussion forward. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My very humble greetings to the dignitaries on the stage, my panelists, to Alapunda, and to all others, particularly also to the very respected consul generals who are out here. I thank you, Shubhadeep and B BCCI, to allow me to do the moderation of this session, though I really know not how much justice I will really be able to do to do this, but I thought that rather than really getting into very scholarly dissection of whether India actually has achieved all the parameters which one would consider a free country should be having in the economy, in the freeness, in the inclusivity, in the secularism, in all other aspects. We would rather keep it more as an anecdotal stories from the three very respected senior gentlemen, two of whom are fortunate to have been born before independence, and one of uh, the three is fortunate enough to be an ancestor to a very famous freedom fighter. So they have a history, all of them, in their own lives, which we can relate to in the pre- and the post-independence times. And therefore, we will keep it more as a kind of stories of their lives. But just few of the things which we would really like to pick up and answer, mm -hmm. and, and maybe deliver it, and maybe after this, Alapunda also is coming. So definitely, everybody knows here the speech that uh, our first Prime Minister, Mr. Jawaharlal Nehru, gave on that 14th August night. So the one particular word, I've never been able to really understand what he exactly meant by that, and whether that has been achieved or not. He mentioned at the stroke of the midnight hour, which we all know, when the world sleeps, India will have it to life and freedom. Freedom, of course, yes, we were coming out of the colonialism. But what he exactly meant by India will have it to life, and whether we have actually got that life, what he meant during that time, and what exactly were the ingredients to the life which he had in his mind is the one definitely that we would like to have some kind of deliberation on. He also mentioned in the para two of his speech, the last line, and that's a famous speech, everyone I'm sure will be remembering that. The past is over and it is the future that beckons us now. And what exactly he meant by the future? And when we are here now on the 75th year, 25 years away from the 100th, are we again in a position to say that the past is over and the future is beckoning us now. So will there be a much difference between what we have traversed and what we will be traversing? He also had an interesting statement, which of course we will be discussing. It means the ending of poverty and ignorance and disease and inequality of the opportunity. How much have we really been able to achieve that? So we'll get into get into more of those discussions very soon through the stories of the three very senior people that how they actually have seen those statements which Mr. Jawaharlal Nehru made have actually come up and are out there to be true. But also while we are all celebrating the 75th year, Shubhudeep, you brought up Rabindranath's uh, uh, 
Gitanjali poem where he spoke about the country, but I must also say that Rabindranath is one such person, along with many others. Barnard Shaw was another fan who subscribed to that thought. Mark Twain is another one. Rabindranath is another one who really was not a very strong person of a proponent of patriotism and nationalism. Because if you read the Rabindranath's views on nationalism, on the Jati Bodh, he actually never was a very strong supporter of the nationalism. And recently, in the month of December, I had to make a speech and for that I had to do a lot of research on India's vision for 75. And because of that research, I actually went around 100 people in the various parts of the country, of the various economic strata, of the various gender, sect, caste, not so much of the urban elites, but more of the marginalized sections of the country. And I tried to get from them their definition of independence. And I wanted to get from them how they are planning to celebrate. It was in December, so in the upcoming August, which is today, the Indian ensuing 75th year of independence. In addition to that, I also had to carry out a strong research of the leaders' views, the past and the present, starting from Roosevelt to Martin Luther King to Gandhiji to many other leaders, their views about independence and how they would like to view or give a view to his country or any country. Let me just place the two outputs of the two researches here. The first one, which is not from so much of an educated but more from marginalized section uh, of the country, I figured out that more I'm traversing down the economic slope of the country, the concept of the country is gradually disappearing. As I'm traversing up to the economic slope, I'm feeling that the country exists more there, more in the urban elites, more in the chambers, more in the, but as I was moving down, say for example, I spend a lot of time with the Birbhum Shautals because I do that also down south also. To them I didn't find a major concept of anything changing in their life with the freedom coming in or what exactly is India and what their dream and their vision should be about India because they had a little bit of dream about their own life. Not a dream also, just some kinds of a solution to their problem, not exactly a dream. And India, there was nothing kind of unconnectedness. And as we traversed from state to state because of the research, I figured out that the connectedness of any common single thread was very much lacking. That what exactly did they mean? And they were, vision was extremely myopic about an independence of the country. Keeping that aside, if we come to the other part, which is when I'm researching on the very important leaders, the political leaders of the world, about their view of the country, I could see that 20 to 25 words could describe at least 100 such leaders' views about the country. Like it has to be, liberal, free, secular, technologically advanced, independent, all such things, 20 to 25 words, spiritual. But there were only one lady, and because I come from Ramakrishna Mission, I do sometimes have to go to that lady to figure out that what she also has been thought, thinking in that time, about India as a country or as an independence. I did not see a single utterance of the word India in any of the things that she was actually talking about as the future. I could only see one word that was humanism. So there was only one word that was also come through Sharodama as well as through the Rabindranath that much beyond the nationalism was the concept of the humanism. And the humanism should be the one single thread that should be the connectedness between every person in the country or even if that goes outside the country and the world. So we really have to figure out a balancing between the humanism and the nationalism as we come to this 75th year and see that when we are dreaming of an India, how connected in the entire 140 crores of this Indian population is with one single thought and what could be that single thought and how am I 
really going to figure out that even if I traverse down the economic slope of the country, the concept of the country is not diminishing as we come down. But today, while we are in the chambers, I think our main discussion should be very much around the prosperity of the industry, the trade and the commerce, not really moving into the social, philosophical, or the other aspects of the freedom. And I would like to start with all of the, one of the very senior presidents of the chamber. And Olukda had some experience as I was talking to him. I mean, he was pretty young. He was eight, nine years old at the time when independence came in. But he had some memories of that 14th August that evening because we spoke at the beginning of Ojaola Nehru's speech. So what happened in that evening? And when we saw whatever he's seen, seen for that time and what changes is he now seeing in terms of the speech that he made and in terms of the other points also, which I thought that we may get some direction from Olukda also. A very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen, my friends on the dais, off the dais, and the guests uh, who are uh, present here. It's a pleasure to be able to address you a few words uh, on, uh, well, tryst, titled Tryst with uh, Destiny. I think uh, uh, both Ambarish and Shubhadeep has explained quite a lot about the background, so I won't uh, go much into that. And one thing we have been discussing, we are told that we won't talk about history very much. We have a very great historian in front of us and we'll hear from him later on. And uh, apart from that, so we will start mainly, we have requested to talk about your own, meaning what you have done, what you have learned in this 75 years and what you expect from uh, in the next, uh, maybe next 75 years from India, what is your vision and things like that. So we will do uh, just that. I am, as I have been already told by Amvarish, uh, a pre-independence child. I am not a child anymore, sure. But uh, where I can still call myself a pre-independence child. Let's go to a date, 14th of August, 1947. 14th, not 15th. The place was not Calcutta, Red Fort, nothing like that. It was a small town called Dinajpur, which is now in Bangladesh, it used to be in India, and then in Pakistan, and now in Bangladesh. 14th of August, I was very small, of course, and I was always shooed away from serious discussions in the family. So, but I, I felt there's some, some discussion, something serious is going on, 14th. So they tried to shoo me away for discussion, but I somehow slipped back. And uh, I understand that uh, there's a lot of rumor, rum some rumor mongering, troublemakers making trouble, uh, sort of bringing in dark clouds for tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow there will be a celebration, but there will be something else also. They, uh, we actually, <laughs> I did a very silly thing. Because uh, I thought that we have to defend ourselves. I was very small, maybe class three or four, I don't remember. So what I did in a middle class family, what weapons you have? You have the, this moti, you do the, cut the vegetables or fish. You have a, that kite-like thing, da, and it, maybe some kitchen knives and some uh, lattes. So I got them all together and put it in one place. So somebody, was, my mother was looking for some of them and they said, why is it? It was here. So then uh, he, I said, I very truthfully said, I gathered them together and they are here. He said, why? Are you going, have you gone mad? I said, no, but you see, the whole point is that we must have some arms for if we have problem tomorrow. And he, she didn't say anything, looked at me and did like this and then took away whatever he wanted. To take away. Came the next day. 15th of uh, August. Why I'm saying this, all this, because this is my first lesson in leadership. At that time, I didn't even know what is leadership. I did, couldn't even spell it. But uh, later on, I realized that. We had a district magistrate in the district town. His name, I think, was Torabali. Six and a half feet tall, Pathan, very healthy, uh, very fair complexion, almost red. 
and he was learning, trying to learn Bengali at that time also. So they had a big meeting, they had a big field in Dhanajpur. They said in undivided Bengal, that was supposed to be next to Garirvat only. Anyway, so next day the meeting was held. And after the meeting, he, uh, he used to write a lot. That time the ICS officers used to write a lot, a lot not only going by more motor cars. Anyway, so he went up and said um, to everyone that, look, I have heard rumors. I have heard rumors, but I can tell you that I am prepared for anything bad. I hope I won't have to use the huge police force that I have got. I hope you don't have to do anything. Please be peaceful. This is a day of celebration and peace. All right. Then the prayers are said, speeches are made. All that we didn't see. We are never allowed to even go out of the house. So we saw, heard it from people who went there later. So the procession started. And the procession came in front of, uh, near our, our house. I was kept within the house, but I slipped away to uh, out. Then... Uh, very near our house, there was a small stationary shop, and there was a small flag up there. Even the owner didn't know that the flag is there, Congress flag, old Congress flag with charka and all that. So someone noticed it, some troublemaker took it and put it and brought it to the ground, dropped it to the ground like this. This chap, Torabali, I don't know where he was. He was somewhere following the procession, but came immediately with uh, prison vans, put those four or five people on the ground, put the flag up wherever it was, saluted it, and then said, oh, carry on. After that, we lived in for four months before he, my father got He was a uh, gathered officer of one divided Bengal. So before we were transferred, four months, there's no, nothing, no trouble, no violence anywhere. I think that is the first lesson of leadership that I took from this gentleman. After that, of course, we, were, we went to school, school uh, and then to college, and then engineering college. You see, I, how things have changed. In that, that time, in the college, we used to debate. It's unbelievable that we used to debate whether co-education is right for the society. So imagine that, having an official debate on that. And today, we, I was with a friend that, uh, that day, is, uh, I think, four or five years old, granddaughter told him, uh, Grandpa, please don't tell anyone here that I also have a boyfriend. And from co-education, doubting, and to this, we have come a long way socially, there is no doubt. I'll now take one or two examples of uh, resilience. As a society, people, as ourselves, if we have become more courageous, more resilient, things like that. We had a plant, we had a plant in Sharjah, near Dubai, everybody knows Sharjah near Dubai. So that plant, you know, ordered a very costly plant, electrostatic precipitator, quite a few million dollars, and that order was given, taken, executed, done. It was supposed to be tested, and then full money should have come. So I got a call from there. I was then, I think, managing director probably already. So I got a call from there that they are not signing any Test reports, test guarantee report, that guarantee has been met. So I said, why is there some problem with the land plant? He said, no problems, are absolutely everything is all right, no problem. The only thing is they're saying that they will sign it later, maybe later, maybe not, we don't understand. So I was to go to Europe, so I thought, okay, I'll tell go via Dubai. And then the plant was being managed, of course, by a British company, not by Arabians or Indian, but a British company, Blue Circle, that is of, uh, defunct now, probably. Anyway, so I, and the general manager of the plant was a Britisher. So I went to him and said, what is the problem? Why are you not signing this? So he said, no, we are looking into it. We shall look into it and see what uh, can be done. I said, do you have doubt it is not? operating properly, the guarantee parameters are not made. He said, no, not really, but we, we shall. I said, look, our people are sitting idle here for the last 15 days, and you are not paying for it. 
So I will, his name is was Ward, I think. Mr. Ward, I'll give you 15 days. And if nothing is done within 15 days, I'll pull out my people and then see whatever is to be done will be done. So when I went back to the office from there, within four, three hours, I got a message that they have, they have signed the place. Imagine the irony and joke. The precipitator operator plant was working all right. Two years later, I got another call, 2.30 a.m. in the morning. I hurt my um, leg on that day, coming down from in the Calcutta Club. Anyway, not in, inebriated, very much in senses, but I still had an accident. Then there, I got a call saying that the whole thing was on fire and the fire is still going on. I said, so why are you calling me? Uh, why aren't you calling the say, uh, plant management has called the general manager, he's in the club, he's not ready to come. Uh, I said, I can't do anything. I can't do anything, this is a plant manager's job. Put down the receiver, it rang again. This time this was the general manager of the owners of the, that was an Indian of the owners. Uh, he said, to Mr. Mukherjee, please catch the next flight to Dubai. You have to tell us what has gone wrong, and we'll take ac uh, action. I said, I am, I am wounded yesterday. I said, wound, wound, I don't know, take a stick, take a uh, person with you, extra if you want. Please can take the next flight to home. Okay, I had to do that. And then he told me in the, that, please go to the plant. I went to the plant, same general manager, British one. And uh, I said, okay, give me the logbook. They said, no, logbooks cannot be given to you. Our orders are not logbooks. Cannot, you are an outsider. I said, of course, no, I am an outsider. I am, I am proud that I am an outsider. But uh, uh, you are coming from India, and uh, you think we have not done everything what is to be done. I said, I don't care. I don't care. I have been asked to look into it. I'll look into it. So no, he cannot give it to you. So again, I called the general manager of the uh, Indian. He was an Indian guy. The, that I'm not being given, so I am leaving. He said, no, don't leave. Wait for 10 minutes. So within 10 minutes, somebody came, and here are the uh, logbooks. So I won't go into the technicalities of the whole thing. The whole thing was, the problem was in the kiln uh, burning, and it was complete neglect, and neglect, the, report, report, the operators continuously reported that something is wrong, unburnt oil is coming, it should be stopped. The general manager said, no, it cannot be stopped, Done. I'll take the risk. And then it was so that molten iron is, was coming out of the plant, dropping on the plant. So uh, there, of course, the company was benefited because it, they, we got a repeat order for the whole, because the whole thing was destroyed. So I've seen that if you are right, if you are on that truth side, you can definitely be tough. And ultimately, the toughness gives results. The toughness gives results, and uh, this has happened in many other places. I'll touch upon one more subject, which is uh, corruption. Everybody talks about it. But there is corruption everywhere, all countries. Bigger the country, bigger the corruption. Everywhere, whether it's US, whether it's Japan, whether it's China, everywhere there's corruption. But we are now talking about our, our country. The feeling, actually, the feeling that it doesn't pay to be with uh, honest, honest work. Would you, would you accept it, or would you like to challenge it, or change it? So, uh, in one case, it so happened that a large steel plant, that was large at that time, now it is not, no longer very large. Anyway, so the, they, they wanted to order a very highly tech, high tech plant, very high tech plant in their blast furnace area. Anyway, okay. So uh, everything was decided, commercial technical discussion over. Then they said, uh, my people said, sir, you have to come because their CMD is taking the meeting, so he wants you to be there. I said, of course, I'll come. I come, here we came, we had a lot of talks, technical, commercial matters, all finalized, everything done. So, and then suddenly the CMD said to our people, the gentleman, can you please go and wait outside? All his men were there. 
I have to speak to Mr. Mukherjee alone. So everybody went out, and I looked at him, said, yes. He said, Mr. Mukherjee, now you are going to get a good order, and uh, we are going to get a good plan. But uh, what is in it for me? So I didn't understand exactly. I said, you have a good plan to show everybody in this country, there's, yours, yours is the second plant like this. He said, no, that's for the company, but what is that for me? Then the penny dropped. Then I understood what he's meaning. But I, have to, I, don't, I don't understand what you are saying. She said, uh, you have to give me X percent of this. I said, sorry, I folded my file and paper and said, sorry, we have never done it, we are never going to do it, I'm sorry, it cannot be done. He said, you will repent it, Mr. Mukherjee, because it's a very large order and you have made very large profit. I said, profit or no profit, it doesn't matter. The point is that we cannot do this. Thank you very much. We went. Outside people were waiting. Have you got it? I said, no, not, not yet, but I have a feeling that we might get it. After one month, we got that order. Another, exactly same thing happened, very briefly. The owner of the, of the plant was very religious, very religious, was giving a lot of donations, a lot of money to various build temples and all that. He exactly did the same thing. To cut it short, I asked him that, uh, Mr. So-and-so, do you believe in, uh, do you believe in religion? He said, yes, of course. I spend so much money in religion, you know. Do, do you believe in God? He said, of course I believe in God. What are you talking? I said, if you believe in God, if you respect him, do you want to give him black money or white money? I was, for a few seconds, I was very scared that he will have a stroke right on there. His whole, whole face became red. Anyway, so we didn't, of course, uh, get, get the order. I will end all, the, there are people who could come with other ideas that um, I have learned one thing, lesson in my life in leadership which I always say that uh, whether you are a leader, social, political, corporate, whether it doesn't matter, but a, a person who wants to lead the orchestra must turn his back to the audience, whether you like it or not. Uh, on top of that, uh, I have seen, have, uh, we have taken over sick companies and made it profitable. A number of big companies uh, making boilers next to BHL only. And when I went there, I said, persistence has no, no replacement. When I went there, they told me, aap to bachcha hai in ABL, Durgapur. They said, aap to bachcha hai. ABB bought it, I was in ABB. Uh, aap to bachcha hai. Aap dekhi, idhar ek aadmi ko aap hatane nahi sakega. I said, then all of us will go down. He said, doesn't matter, we'll go down. But I'm giving you a challenge. You just make one man take your VRS. The total strength was 5,500. The plant needed at best 1,500 or 2,000. It was the government of India plant, closed for quite some time. So I, it took me six months to, to convert that challenge into the opportunity. And he, uh, there was a gate meeting and they said that, well, this company is going to offer uh, VRS. So from the union, we are advising you to take it if you have no other problem. Okay, I, with the permission to conclude, I will uh, read the two lines of what Nehru said and my comments on it. He said in this famous uh, speech of uh, Trist with uh, Destiny, he said, a moment comes, which comes but rarely in the history of a nation, when you step out from the old to the new, when an era ends, and when the soul of a nation, long suppressed, find utterance, find deliverance. Full stop. That was Nehru. My only submission to you is that India at 1947 might not have that capability, the strength, the solidity to drive strongly 
But India at 2022 is a strong party. Whatever messes we have made, it doesn't matter. Whichever party has come and gone, doesn't matter. They have made a lot of mess again. But in spite of that, together, all together, politicians, us, everybody, have taken it from one level to another. India was at one level in 47. Most certainly, it is a much higher level that we have together. It doesn't matter who rules us, who doesn't rule us. Everybody together, we have made it. And now, I think in 75 years, we are seeing, I hope that in 100 years, we'll see a lot more, a third uh, economy, largest economy in the world. You see, the world turns. The earth revolves around the sun. Each nation has its own ups and downs. But today, it is India's moment. It can and must grasp and forge a new path for itself. And it's for all of us, particularly the next generation, to do it. Thank you very much for your patience. All of the, thank you very much. It was really a good uh, traversing down the history and going back to that evening of 19, 14th August 1947, but interesting that you were actually preparing yourself to welcome the independence with Da, Kurul, Kodal. So that's very interesting. So I mean, you were dreading independence or? <laughs> okay. But the one takeaway from your speech is, I mean, of course, you established that through your corporate handling. But we can go beyond the corporate and one takeaway from your speech is that a fearlessness. You felt that the leadership should always be accentuated or decked with fearlessness. And if we take it beyond the corporate, we also therefore have to see that India as it goes from the 75th to the 100th year, whether that fearlessness, which is an environment should be fostering a fearlessness in every sphere of life, whether we have really been able to achieve that or whether we need to do something more to get into that state of fearlessness, and which is so true. Because I think Roosevelt once said that fear is the only fear that Americans should have. And this has also been always been echoed by Swamiji also that how important the fearlessness is. But we also definitely need to see that whether an environment of that has really been created here and whether we will be able to create that environment. We'll come back to you on that again. But the one point I'm very interested to discuss with you once when we have gone through the first round is you were born in an undivided Bengal. That's right. Today we are divided. And today the both sides have a lot of similarity also. Now had we been still undivided, or can we still create an environment of a non-division between Bengal and Bangladesh and have a much bigger prosperity in combined trade and economy through the establishment of much more business linkages and all other kinds of linkages is a topic that possibly will come back in our discussion again, that from the 75th to the 100th year of journey, whether that could be one that we can, of course, politically, we will stay separated out, but economically and trade-wise, can that undivided Bengal be again brought back? With this, now I will move to Partho Babu. Partho Babu have two, two very interesting aspects which we would like to cover. One, Partho Babu's father was a freedom fighter, and therefore Partho Babu has a lot of stories, possibly, from his father when his father was actually fighting for the freedom of the nation, what was his vision about the India? What triggered him? What motivated him to fight for the India? Of course, that one motivation cannot be just to extricate India from the hands of the Britishers, but thereafter, he definitely had a vision for an independent India. And what was that vision? And the second thing, which is more important, which is not, which is through Partho Babu's own life, he actually has been through and through in a public sector where he also moved up to be the chairman at a very young age. And this concept of this public sector in the core sect, core areas, steel, coal, oil, created or floated by Jawal Nehru at one point in time. And thereafter, the Indian economy has traversed a lot of things, the public sector, and the core, sect, core areas, agrarian economy, then the license raj, then the liberalization, 
then the digitalization, the service sector, IT, India has traversed through a lot of such economic, I should say, various kinds of movements. The governance style also has changed from the public sector to the private sector. And from Partho Babu, we would like to hear that these changes, how that has affected Indian economy and what he feels as the governance style as that was yesterday and which is today and that should be for tomorrow. Thank you, Amurish. Uh, <clears throat> distinguished panelists, distinguished guests of the dais, Mr. Halabun Bondobadhai, the ex-chief secretary, the consulate <coughs> officials. It is indeed a pleasure. I must thank uh, Bengal Chamber for conceiving this session of a very special kind of a session for India at 75, and also for inviting me to be a panelist in today's, today's discussion. <coughs> As uh, rightly told by Amurish, that I am not a pre-independence child. I was born post-independence. But the flair of what happened prior to independence has come to me uh, through my revered father. Uh, my father's name was Binay Krishna Bhattacharya. He was born in 1915 in a village called uh, Kotalipara in a subdivision called Madaripur in Faridpur district of now Bangladesh, that time uh, East Bengal. Very early in his life, he was attracted by revolutionaries in that area. That area was full of revolutionaries. And he was found to be, he was suspected to be, uh, sort of exchanging notes between very important uh, revolutionaries at that time. So the family uh, immediately got him <clears throat> shifted to Calcutta and put him in a school there. Otherwise, uh, to, to avoid the risk of being put in a prison at that time. So after coming here, he was a very meritorious student. He became a doctor from Calcutta Medical College. And in those days, a uh, coveted job was considered to be the Indian Medical Services, which is basically British Army. And he had a sort of a, he was angst against Britishers in, in general. But of course, that was a job. He, his first posting was Bareilly, Mirat, sorry, Mirat. And his second posting was Singapore. So Singapore was bombed by the Japanese and Singapore fell to the Japanese and he was taken a POW prisoner of war by the Japanese forces. Uh, the family got a communication from the British government, from the Diden government, that uh, Captain Bhattacharya is missing and suspected dead. So there was quite a bit of commotion in the family. He was the third child. <clears throat> uh, but after some time, maybe after a year after that, there was a S uh, sort of a small slots given to every officer who was captured and who, was, who became a POW to speak from Radio Tokyo. And somebody in Calcutta heard him, so they, could, they were sort of happy that he's alive. From there, he joined the Indian National Army. He came to <laughs> Burma Arakan border. And in, his, in that <coughs> frame of things, uh, in INA, it is not that the doctors will do only a doctor's job. They were supposed to be in the war field as well. So I come to a couple of small anecdotes. In one of the uh, instances, he was sent to lead a team for planting mines in the railway track so that the drill coming from uh, with the British army gets exploded. And he did that for about 15, 20 days, came back to the hospital. He was in charge of a ward at that time. And the day he came, the very next day, there was a visit of Subhash Chandra Bose, Netaji, into that hospital. He came to the ward, uh, looked at my father and said that you seem to have slimmed down. I mean, that was the kind of memory that Subhash Bose used to have. And he used to know people by, by name, by face, and all that. So then the commanding officer of the hospital, he explained that he was on this kind of a duty. 
So when he went for ward inspection, he had a particular format. <coughs> I'm talking about Nitaji. He will move from one end of the ward to the other end and then shout at the top of the voice, Kisi ka koi shikayat hai? Anybody has any complaints? And if there is a complaint from a patient, that particular doctor starts shivering. So that's exactly, unfortunately, what happened. He asked and somebody raised his hand. So my father and Subhas Bose and um, Nidaji and the commanding officer, they all went to that patient, said, what is the complaint? And what the patient said was so touching. He said that, Mera ek haath chala gaya, ek paer chala gaya, aur ek aank chala gaya. Lekin mera dusra haath hai, dusra paer hai, aur dusra aank bhi hai. I have lost uh, one, uh, one hand, one leg, and one eye, but I have the other set intact. I want to go back to the war. And these gentlemen are not, not allowing me to do that. You kindly tell them. That was his complaint. So <coughs> it, was, it was really, I mean, a lot of passion, a lot of nationalism, a lot of patriotism was there in that kind of an atmosphere. Another occasion, <laughs> it's, it's also a very interesting occasion. I mean, Netaji had a principle that people should be taking protein at the cheapest price. So therefore, both pork and beef were part of the menu. I mean, they had to take both of them. It was going on smoothly. But on this part of the country, Bangla, I mean, East Bengal, West Bengal, some tensions had started. And you know, that also had some effect. So maybe the menu was more loaded towards one of these varieties and therefore there was some clutter coming up. Uh, so why should there be so much of beef or pork or whatever it is? This news went to the COCNC. COCNC is the, is the chief of commanding army who is Netaji himself. He just drove into the langar, that was called langar, <coughs> where people eat. He walked from one end to the other, came back to the center, and just uttered one sentence, that gulam ka aur koi jaat nahi hota, wo gulam hai. There's no other caste or creed of somebody who is a slave. A slave is a slave. And he left the place. Thereafter, there has been no problem as long as the INA was there. I mean, that was his kind of control over the, over the people. So, <laughs> My father was captured in the Arakans and taken to Red Fort. He was one of the officers who was tried in the Red Fort. And ultimately, in 1946, after the movement taken, done by Mahatma Gandhi, he came back. And uh, after a few years, he again rejoined the Indian Army. After he rejoined, he found a bit of a conflict between the officers who were continuing from the British days. And very few handful of people from INA had also gone there. But there was a bit of a contempt and a bit of, you know, I mean, INA officers were not taken uh, in the right spirit. So in one of the occasions, this was, I, I just learned from him at that point in time. Of course, I lost my father at the, when I was 12 years of age. So I only vaguely remember all these things. But this one I remember. So <laughs> there was an occasion, some sort of a dinner or something going on in a mess day or something. And there, the commanding officer, who was a South Indian officer, he made a statement that an army personnel is an army personnel. He can't move from one side to the other side. If he does that, he's a traitor. He made a categorical statement. My father was a junior officer there. I mean, naturally junior to him. In army, there is a unity of command. You normally are not supposed to <laughs> respond to such any comment by the seniors. But he retorted. He retorted by saying, that to those who could do a Jalionwala bag kind of a treachery or kill more than a million people of my country in a single famine, I'd far more prefer to be called a traitor by them than to be called a trusted slaves and servant. So the dinner meeting stopped there. <laughs> he resigned from the army sometime in 1955. There was some problem there and the resignation got, effect, got uh, accepted much later, sometime in 1960. But soon after, he was called back because of the Portugal War. And then there was Chinese War. See, he was, he was in Ladakh for a while. There he suffered a heart attack. He had a second attack, and he died in 1963. So that's what. Now, <clears throat> coming to the impact that all this had on me, I can say I'd learned two things. One is to be fearless, again. And to take situations as they come, 
with the best spirit. I was not a very good student. Uh, during my father's, when he was alive, I was only good in history, and that's again because of his uh, contribution. He used to teach me quite contrary things than what is prescribed in the textbook, and he used to ensure that I write that in the examination, some class eight, class nine, that time. And in one case, this was uh, the, uh, your <laughs> black hole tragedy here. So whatever was written in the book, he said, this is all wrong. He told me something, I wrote that, and I was called in the principal's room, because it was a convent school. The history professor was an Englishman. Fortunately, the principal was an Irishman, so I got saved. So <laughs> that's how it was, it went on happening. <clears throat> we came back to uh, Calcutta after his death, and uh, the standard of life had a drastic fall, because you know, army life is good, and here it was just a one-room one kind of place where we started our journey. I was not a good student, but I had the urge that I have to do something different. And in two years' time, from being a poor scorer in maths, physics, etc., etc., I cracked IIT. So it showed that things can be done. I got a little bit of internal confidence. Though I didn't study in IIT, I came back, uh, did my BSc, joined a bank, did my MSc, continued in the bank, and became a bank officer. Then I realized that this is not the job for, made for me. I mean, <clears throat> that again, that same urge, that this is not challenging enough. There is no challenge. At that time, there were two companies which were accepting graduate trainees or management trainees. One was Coal India, the other was ONGC. ONGC was for scientists. Coal India was for management training. I cracked both the exams, went to Delhi for ONGC. I was more interested in ONGC because that was science, scientist and I was a physicist. So I was thinking that that is a more appropriate thing. But then they wanted a particular specialization. They wanted a specialization in electronics. I was not having that. I, was having, I specialized in solid state physics. So they said, go to that room, collect your reimbursement of train fare, and go back. <laughs> no interview. So that's how it happened. Coal India I got through. I joined in Coal India. Uh, so it was quite a decision to leave a confirmed good bank officer's job and join as a management trainee in a company like Coal India. Which, is, which was just under creation at that time. I mean, it was just developing. Uh, <clears throat> things were not very clear where the posting would be, if it is in a coal field, what kind of life will be there. I have to leave my mother alone. So all these problems were there, but I, still, I thought that this is worth it. Let's, let's take it head on. Fortunately, that clicked. The whole journey in coal India has been very, very eventful. And uh, I think I could meet up with all the kind of challenges. I'd like to describe just one or two challenges in Coal India. Uh, I rose fast enough. I never missed a promotion. So I became the CMD of a dreaded company called Bharat Cooking Coal Limited, many of you may be aware of. A company which never made profits right from its birth. It was perennially loss making. Mafia infested. There's a lot of mafia around. And a very difficult company to work for. I remember I <coughs> fell out with the local MP. There was a, there was a big problem. In fact, when the MP in 2004, the, after the elections, the MP who came, he was a Congress MP. Earlier, it was a BJP <coughs> general, a lady who was the MP there. And this person was not based in Dhanbad. He was based from Palamo. And I had to come to Calcutta for a surgery of my wife. So during that period, about 10 days, there was nobody to greet him or send him some flowers and bouquets and all that. So I, when I came back, I called him up. He said, you have 10 days to Give me a big quarter. And I found that there is no rule in the, in the company's books to allow a quarter for an MP. So I told him straight away that uh, this is something I can't do. But then I'll not allow you to exist here. Well, fine, very fine. I mean, <coughs> you are, you are uh, the ruling party in the government, so if you can get, get me a job elsewhere, I mean, government will not sack me. So uh, it will be fine. So that fight continued. One of the means, <laughs> I, I was sure that I'm, I'm, I will try and get this company revived. And one of the measures that we tried was to outsource, <coughs> com supplement companies, internal production, de departmental production by outsourcing. We started the first outsourcing in a railway patch, which was under fire, where, where coal was under fire. So we took out the railway lines, <coughs> tendered it, and gave the order to somebody. 
when the work started, this person straight away came, went there and stopped the work. At that time, the coal ministry was with the prime minister. So the prime minister convened a meeting of all the CMDs in his residence. I still remember the date. It was a Sunday, 31st of October, 2004. So uh, then I told him that this is the kind of extra coal that I can produce. And it was all high quality metallurgical coal, very rare in this country, all imported. I said, what is the problem? I said, this is the problem that the MP is creating. He said, okay, I'll talk to him. Let us see, sort it out. Nothing got sorted out. Only thing that happened was a fire came up. Fire was visible over a stretch of one kilometer. So I made a news. I used to have three or four media guys with me. I made a news. I'm sorry, I'm talking in Hindi. Maybe <coughs> some of you may have a problem. I mean, I can't really quickly translate that. So <coughs> once that was said, he called me up and said, ah, politics, you're doing politics. I said, no, but I'm feeling quite bad about it, that my, this coal is burning and we don't have money. This company is in dire needs. We can't pay salaries. This is the kind of problem that's happening and you are not allowing it to work. So I said, Aap se jaiye. Go, go away from here. Don't stay here. I said, fine. So there was a change in the government, in the ministry. <coughs> Mr. Sibu Soren, who is a local leader of Jharkhand, he became the coal minister. Once he became the coal minister, Immediately, I took that opportunity and made a national news of the whole thing. The fire was more visible at that time. So he came running. And when he came running, I said, he says, what happened? I said, you know what, what is there, but I can explain it to you. I don't know. I know everything. He asked his next person <coughs> that pick up people from that village, that village, and that village with bows and arrows. Or market you, market you Drive them out. The MP was in Dhanbad on that day. He quickly boarded a train and came to Delhi and got admitted in Ames with a chest pain. And I didn't to lose time that time. I immediately, within half an hour of his admission, I sent him a goodwill uh, message, a get well message and a bouquet. So no delay that time. He was furious. He wanted to stop it at any cost. So one place where he started his fight was a standing committee of, parliament, of, of MPs in parliament. There he blasted me. I was supposed to attend that meeting. So we, we all went there. He blasted me. The uh, chairman was Anand Kumar, uh, BJP MP. He said, why, why are you doing this outsourcing? I said, I can't pay salaries to 100,000 people unless I do this. I have to produce more coal. Then he said, OK, OK, sit down. <laughs> sat down. When he couldn't do anything there, he came back to Dhanbad every time and shouted at the top of his voice, Ban karing him. We had, to, we had to stop it, stop it, stop it, and all that. So I felt a bit of a danger. I was a little <coughs> worried about it. So what I did was I used all the money that, is be, that was being generated to meet the employee-related expenses. Employee salaries used to happen 28 days later. When I, salary due on first used to happen at the end of the month. So I brought it into shape every month, five, six days like that. So employees were very happy. Then we collected some money, and there was a huge PF areas, Provident Fund areas. We, give it to the Provident Front authorities and ensure that that is, <clears throat> gets a good coverage in the news, in the media, etc. So in 2004 he won, 2005 there were state assembly elections and Dhanbad parliamentary constituency is actually five assembly segments and he was sure of Congress winning every one of those. He lost in all the five. When he lost in all the five, then after about three, four days I got a call from the gate, from the CISF people saying that he's trying to gate crash and come to your chamber with 200 people. I said, 200 people can't be accommodated, but let him come with 15, 20. So he came and he si simply said that, I am told that you have managed something, done something. Your employees didn't vote for me. I took him aside <laughs> into the ante room and told him that, well, I didn't do anything, but you did. You were criticizing the very program which was bringing light in their lives. So my 100,000 people had 300,000 votes which you didn't get. And that's the reason for this. He went away with all his people, came back after 15 days, said, yes, you are right. Now I have to retrieve my status. What do I do? I said, that you decide. So then he said that, okay, there was a statue of Mahatma Gandhi in Dhanbad station, near the railway station. He said, that was broken long time back. I want to reinstall that. <laughs> you have to be with me. And I mean, what form? He said, you build the podium and be with me on that day. I said, done. So we did that, and then we became friends. So this was one episode in it.
And can I have another 50 minutes time? So that ultimately <laughs> led me to the corner office in Cold India. I became chairman in October 2006. And the first thing that I noted is there's a problem of uh, image. The, the image of Cold India, I mean, the, the company is huge, large, but the image is more dictated by the color of the commodity it produces, which was not the right thing to happen. So, <clears throat> so I thought that that has to change. Now, how does that change? So I picked up four or five sentences. And I'd like to narrate that. First, Cold India produces 40% of commercial energy in this country, which is more than the aggregate of all the oil and gas companies taken together. Now, nobody knew this. It was a revelation. It does all that without any kind of subsidization, direct or indirect. Number two, it offers coal, delivers coal at a price which, compared to international prices of the same quality, is at least 50% cheaper. As if this is not enough, after doing all this, it's, uh, it manages to earn a profit operating margin of 25 to 30%, pays to government taxes and dividends to the tune of thousands of crores. So which is a company of comparable strategic relevance? So this was four or five bullets, which was put in, you know, uh, this Air India had this, Indian Airlines had this magazine called Swagat, it was there in Swagat, in many places, started coming up. So that got a little bit of a, gave it a lot, some traction. We got Miniratna in 2007, got Navaratna in 2008, but with a condition, because Navaratna was given only to listed companies and Coal India was not listed. It was a nightmare to consider Coal India to be listed because of the kind of reputational problems it had. But the condition of Navaratna was that within three years, you have to get listed. Now it happened in October 2008. I used to retire in February 2011. So I could jolly well leave it to my successor, but I thought that this is something I cannot leave it to. Normally, successor will be a mining engineer, which I am not. I am a finance guy. So this is something that I should be doing. So we started on a very serious note. Initially, we were having huge problems. We do, did dipstick studies, found that the global perception is very poor. But all that was sorted out. And <clears throat> when the an announcement of IPO was made, fortunately, we had a fantastic uh, finance minister at that time. We had a great disinvestment secretary at that time. So it worked like a team, and the results were absolutely resounding. I mean, we couldn't imagine the kind of response that the global investors would give. The IPO was uh, subscribed, I mean, oversubscribed 15 times overall, and institutionally 25 times. Normally, uh, PSU IPOs are bailed out by, say, by SBI and LIC. And I was <clears throat> being told that please talk to these two chairmen and keep them alive. I deliberately avoided all that. On the third day, each of them <coughs> pumped in 13,000 crores and got only 460 crores worth of shares. That's because it was oversubscribed 25 times. It remains the largest IPO even today, even after the LIC IPO. If you put the IPO, if you denominate the IPO in dollar terms, it was $3.5 billion, LIC was 2.7. In terms of <laughs> listing at premium, it was listed with a premium of 40%. No large IPO in this country in the last 20 years were listed at a premium. Normally, it went down. And the money that chased that IPO was 233,000 crores, out of which $27 billion were from <laughs> international firms. The IPO price was very tightly made, uh, kept. It was benchmarked to the best, coal per best performing coal company in the world. So that's how... This IPO went through, it was a, absolutely a spectac spectacular kind of a thing. And all that I, <coughs> I feel has happened because of some internal courage, which I got from my father, and some luck, of course. And uh, maybe an effort to you know, do the best, or rather excel under every circumstance. I think I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bhattacharya. We'll come back to you again, and possibly will not allow you to stop there. My, uh, really, my home is to your 48-year-old father, who achieved uh, or did so much in his 48-year life. Uh, interestingly, I heard this story in much bigger detail from uh, Pathoda about this Coal India IPO, and you wrote this in your book also, no? The Coal, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, so I have read that book also, The Coal is Gold. That's the name of the book. Coal. When Coal Turned Gold. Yeah, there's a very interesting story, and if all can. And I, in you one day told me also in one hour in detail story about the happenings. And I think if at any point, at any point in time, the 75 years of Indian independence, I mean, any chronic, it's, if it is chronicled, and with some incidents, this Coal India IPO, I think, should be there. It's one of the one, definitely a story that needs to go in these 75 years of history. But I'll come back to you about the future progress of the Indian, the other public sector, public sector's privatization. Because maybe you started it. You started it and you have shown how a public sector can be privatized. But is the future lies there? I mean, should we be getting into the divestment path more in the next 25 years when we reach the 100? And what kind of complications there will be? Because we hear the contra views also in terms of the divestment, in terms of the privatization. We hear the contra views. We love to hear about your views on that also. In fact, I remember. If uh, that, that Jawaharlal Nehru once told uh, uh, JRD that J, I hate the word profit, don't utter the word to me. Now, how days have changed from there? I mean, of course, he didn't believe it in a very poor economy. He didn't mention it in a very poor economy sense. He mentioned it more from a morality aspect. But how we have changed today and how the public sectors have changed and making also profit, and Colinda is one such example. Uh, with this, I will now go to Mr. Sen. Mr. Sen mainly, uh, Mr. Sen also is another one who was born before independence. So I think on the 1947, on that day, he was eight years old. He also has some memories of that evening. And Mr. Sen also has worked in multinationals. So therefore, he brings his experience on the change of the multinationals that he has seen, and a person of industrial management, and how education has changed in engineering, and what today's engineers are compared to the previous engineers, and how what kind of engineers being we should be having also to go to that 100th year. Shubhadeep, uh, how much time do we have? Five minutes. Fifteen. Ladies and gentlemen, when I, the first word that I would like to say is the word that has been said by Pandit Jala Nehru, the tryst with destiny. This is a speech which I think is one of the greatest speeches of the 20th century. It is a speech made from heart. It is a speech talks about the future. It is a speech talks about the nation. And a speech talks about national pride. Having said this, every time, even today, after so many years, every time I hear this speech, I am absolutely gets inspired. And I find its relevance though it's not exactly the same relevance as it was earlier, but every year, I, every time I read the speech, I find it's relevant. And that truly makes me, uh, I mean, really makes me inspired. I am, as has been told to you, I am a pre-independence uh, born person, pre-independent pre person, and uh, when I was, uh, and I, I, I of course gone to school in Delhi, and then I came to Calcutta to do my engineering, and I stayed back. A few days back when Shubhadeep uh, told me that uh, this discussion would be taking place here, and uh, he wanted me to join the panel, and he told, I told him exactly what are we going to discuss. He told me that what has changed in the last 75 years. I thought about it and I realized that everything seems to have changed in the last 75 years, everything. Our way of thinking, our way of life, our, the way we work, everything has changed in this uh, last 75 years. Uh, 
when in 1947, when we got the independence, as uh, Amrish has just mentioned, that uh, I was eight years old, and obviously I was too small, and I was there when the flag was hoisted. I was riding on the top, of, in the shoulder of my father, and uh, I saw the Union Jack going down, and I saw the Indian national flag going up, and hundreds and thousands of people around. And uh, what astonished me was the expression on their faces. Some were in tears, some had moist eyes. And being a child, I was wondering what is happening? I mean, why is this, this emotion? And so I looked very hard at the flag, which was flying. I looked hard and hard and hard, but I just could not understand. It was a small, it was because I was standing far away. It was a tiny looking flag flying, tricolor. And it was looking small from where I was there. And I just didn't realize it. And I realized this passion many years later. What was going on in your mind? There has been a lot of changes now that uh, uh, Alavan Babu is here. I'll share something which was changing. You see, during the British period, the administration was done by ICS, Indian Civil Service people. Most of them were Britishers and a few Indians too. And I believe Nitaji was uh, also, uh, he qualified for ICS and then he did not take it. But during this war, we had this uh, great war going, Second World War was going on. And during that time, what happened was that government needed to have a huge uh, machinery for uh, feeding, uh, uh, supplying goods and services to the, uh, for the war effort. And during the time, the British government actually set up a department called Supplies Department. It was headed by some of the leading scientists of our time, of that time, and some of the leading uh, professionals, administrators. All the specialists came together, and the whole thing was started. One such group was led by Dr. Gan Ghosh. Some of you may know uh, Mr. P.B. Ghosh, was Mr. P.B. Ghosh, uh, who was the managing director of CSC. Uh, he was, uh, Dr. Ghosh was his father. So Dr. Gan Ghosh and my father, and he, Dr. Ghosh was told that please bring across, from across this country, bring all the scientists, great scientists, professionals, and administrators, and start the supply department as a part of the war effort. Uh, so Dr. Gan Ghosh uh, asked my father, who was quite a renowned, Scientist who was a Dr. Dinesh Chandra Sen, late Dr. Dinesh Chandra Sen. My father was DSC and a Prem Chandra Chat scholar. Uh, he was from chemistry and he was the one who did his uh, research under Acharya Prabhupada Chandra Rai. So, and Dr. Ghosh was also his teacher. So he was called and other scientists were called and the supply department was started. When the war ended, why, why I'm telling this story is when the war ended, the government had a huge pool of highly competent, specialized uh, professionals, scientists. And all the Britishers went back. And there was a vacuum. So what the government did was they got this pool together and allocated them to various different ministries. And this was the beginning of Indian Administrative Service. This is where and how it started. When ICSs were gone, everybody was gone, and these specialized pool became the uh, Indian Administrative Service. Of course, there was no examination at that time, but this is how, this is the history, possibly very unknown to many, but I'm aware of it because I was in Delhi at the time and I know how it came about. And then my father, of course, joined Ministry of Commerce and Industry, and then later on, 
he came to Union Public Service Commission and retired as the Secretary of Union Public Service Commission. Now this is, I wanted to share, I'm happy that Alpin Babu is here because this is a story unknown, actually. This is almost unknown. As far as I'm concerned, I come to, from the period of, I became an engineer when the tool was slide rule. I don't know how many of you really know what slide rule is. That was a tool that was used for calculation, all kinds of calculation. I'm talking about a period when computers were a dream. I'm talking of a period where even the calculators did not exist. This was a time we came out as an engineer. I came out as an engineer using slide rule. Okay, you possibly will see a slide rule, some, some of you. If you want to, want to see, you'll possibly find this in some of the technical university, technical museums. Of course, I have one in my house, in a very old trunk. Uh, it's still there with me. I just couldn't throw it away. I just loved it. So having said this, now, and when we started working, of course, uh, Ambarish has mentioned that I did work, I do work with uh, in a multinational company, foreign company, but uh, I started working there. It's today an Indian company. But when I started working, I was with Bern Howrah. That's where I started. And um, uh, I learned the skill. During that time, the skill was transferred differently. It was like what we call in uh, our uh, Indian parlance, you know, in art and culture, like a guru shishya transformation. That's how the knowledge was transferred, and this is how we learned. I learned from my uh, guru in in the industry. He was the uh, works manager of that plant, plant, and I also learned from the uh, from the from the blue colored um, uh, mysteries and the language. I spoke, if I sometimes, by slip of tongue, I, do the language come out? Measurements. I don't know how many will understand when I say that you measure it by, you see, this was the inch. I'm talking about a period when India was not metric. It was still inch. That is the when I started working. During my, during my period, of course, I worked with uh, many companies. I was a shipbuilder, I was a wagon builder, I was a crane manufacturer, I was steel plant machinery, I am steel plant machinery manufacturer, mining machinery manufacturer, I mean, I've done a lot of things because I've been in this working life for a long, long, long time. And uh, when I was, uh, I, uh, when I, I, I was a plant, uh, plant manager of Hooghly Docking when I was 25 years old, and uh, uh, this was a large shipbuilding company, that company still exists, of course, uh, a large company, but shipbuilding company, and uh, I was the plant manager. And then uh, I'm telling this story because how the attitude changed and why it was necessary to change. And then uh, my, my, um, uh, uh, the person who was the general manager of the company, he had a heart attack and I was told to take over uh, the position. This was a company which belonged at that time to Martin Byrne, a very British company. <coughs> Indian company, but very British. So I was called to Martinman House and saying that after I took over as general manager, I was called there and told to meet uh, the then the chairman, Sir Biran Mukherjee, and his son, Raman Mukherjee, and the rest of the board. So I go there and um, there was one special lift, only meant to go to the director's floor. I don't know how many any of you have gone to Martinman House at that time, I don't know. But any, uh, one, only one floor lift. So when I go there, I told uh, uh, the director who was looking after our company, Hoogly Docking, I said, look, I am coming from the plant and I can't wear a jacket or a tie. This was mandatory because they're very, very, very British, okay? I was told, no, you have to wear a jacket and a tie. I said, no, I can't, then I can't go. That's it. So they talked about it and Sir Biran Mukherjee said, yes, he understands my position and uh, I do not have to wear a jacket and tie. Doesn't matter. When I go there, the lift man says, uh, uh, in, of course, in local language, that uh, this is not, uh, you are not, you cannot go in this lift. I said, why? 
He said, yeah, you're not wearing a jacket and a tie. I said, no, I've been called by Sir Biran Mukherjee to meet him. Ah. So he said that, but you will lose your job. I said, why? He said, no, anybody who goes there without a jacket and tie loses their job. I said, fine, it's okay, I'll do that. So I go there and uh, uh, I meet him and I come down and uh, this man was really surprised. He asked me, Chalagya, has it gone? Your job is gone. I said, no, he did not. So he said, Gazab ka time ka gaya abhi. Uh, time has changed, that's what he said. And now why I'm saying this is that <clears throat> even during those early days, we were very British. India was very British, industry was very British, and uh, there has been a total transformation from that time to today. Though I'm wearing a jacket, but it's because it's, the air conditioning is too cold. So, but having said that, uh, uh, well, uh, there has been a lot of changes. But when I talk about how India has transformed, during that time, we always thought that what we manufacture in India is not really of the right standard. Everybody in the world thought what was, India was excellent in art and craft and culture, but whatever is one manufacture, cannot stand against the products which come from Europe some, or United States. But today is totally different. We do have products, we manufacture products using same technology. And uh, of course today the manufacturing competence has also changed. It's changing totally because we are no longer in the side rule age. We are in computer age. Today we do, we are in the, we also do in India um, 3D printing. We are in the, uh, getting up ourselves to industry 4.0. Those are all there. And but having said this, even we are recognized today, India is recognized today to be um, uh, one of the best manufacturer of uh, engineering products. Uh, from as and comparable with anywhere in the world. In fact, uh, we do, we do, in fact, uh, uh, and we do it, and we do it more economically, that's more interesting. So, all the foreign countries, all the Western countries, developed countries, do look at India as the main, as a, a major source of manufactured goods. I'm only, t I am only talking about engineering goods because that is where I have worked with and can't talk about the others. But having said this, uh, every, every area, be it uh, IT, ITE, with the digital uh, sciences, everything, everything is changing. And India remains at, in pace and is also, also continues to be the major contributor to these uh, changes which is taking place across the world. With this, I think I'll stop now. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sen. What I will do, I'll come back to the question answer with all three of you. But before that, I'll request the panelist, uh, Alapunda, to come up and make his speech. But uh, there are three things which for three uh, gentlemen have uh, question in mind. So I'm just ask, ask these questions to you after all upon the speech. All of the, with you, I will have a question that undivided Bengal, what could have happened? I mean, in terms of what, uh, not now, but I'll just, one other, yeah. And what would be the trade scenario if we can create something like an undivided Bengal? Parthu Babu, I would like to request about the public sector's divestment for the next 25 years going to the 100. What should be our policy philosophy? And you brought in a very strong good dimension of the technological prowess of India. But even now, the import-export balance of the India is much towards the import. We still have a deficit. So what can we do in the next 25 years so that that balance could actually be more towards our export? With this, uh... Thank you, sir. In fact, fearlessness is something that has you know, kind of come up again and again during the discussions. And although Rabindranath may not have been an ultra-nationalist, but we still go back to where the mind is without fear. 
um, from fearlessness to inspiration. And who better to be inspired from than Shialapan Bandhapadhyay, uh, a gold medalist from Calcutta University, a man who worships reading and learning. And very frankly speaking, you know, we have had several opportunities to interact with him. My colleague Shoma and I, and whenever, you know, sort of, uh, we used to go and meet him, Alapon sir, in his chambers, Shoma at least used to tell me that we have to actually go prepared and be, you know, well-read, remember your history well, you know, talk about, you know, know your polity well, so that, you know, there can be questions from Alapon sir, not about the work, but on, you know, other issues, you know, regarding the world affairs. <laughs> So, without any further ado, may I request Alapon sir to please come up. Mr. Amburi Dash Gupta, Mr. Mukherjee, Mr. Shen, Mr. Bhattacharya, distinguished members of the audience, we are running late, so we should be quick. And I would like to summarize what I thought about the whole thing. I missed the initial part of Mr. Shen's speech. Where did you observe this independence program? In which town? Uh, Delhi. I was in Delhi. Now. You are not from East Bengal. I am from East Bengal. But I that particular program you watched in Delhi. Very interestingly, all four are from East Bengal. And none of them discussed partition when they were discussing independence. This is what I noted. But such a buoyant note of optimism that you did not discuss the tragedies of partition, even though Mr. Mukherjee was apprehending riots. Ambarishi was getting ready with Moti and all that, not in anticipation of independence, but in anticipation of communal riots in those frenzied days. So, yes. You are right. <clears throat> the one very interesting takeaway from this session today was all the speakers have incidentally given <clears throat> extraordinary emphasis. I don't think I have attended any program in the last several years where such extraordinary emphasis has been given on the element that they were giving emphasis upon today, which is which is courage in a specific sense, values in general, and patriotism also in general. Mr. Dashgupto was mentioning nationalism, was wondering whether Tagore would approve of nationalism, but I think there is a <clears throat> very important distinction between nationalism in its violent, xenophobic sense and patriotism in its spiritual sense. When you say your country must be the limit of your imagination, I will join issues with that. I will agree with Mr. Dashgupto and his Tagore that patriotism should not be the liminal boundary for us. But as long as patriotism inspires us, to make India great, as long as patriotism takes me out of my selfishness, makes me less greedy, makes, makes me a bit of less coward, I think this is a wonderful spiritual frame to draw sustenance from. And pardon my saying so, some of the metropolitan <coughs> left liberal intellectuals have probably occasionally unnecessarily derided patriotism. There is a lot to learn from patriotism. The fire that Mr. Vattacharya was mentioning was present in Shubhash Chandra Bosch when he said that Gulami is the only caste that we are all having. That fire is a bit of fire in patriotism which historiographers in a school called Cambridge School miss, which many realists miss but which did actually inform many of our activities in those turbulent years of our freedom struggle. And today, probably coincidentally, due to several factors that we all know, 
that fire has suddenly been rekindled in this wonderful evening of today and all the distinguished speakers have probably underlined that finally the value of patriotism, courage, fearlessness in whichever mode we talk that probably remains important and that is quite inspiring for me also as an attendee in this very distinguished symposium that the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industries has arranged. I <coughs> had discussed some of these issues with Sri Dash Gupta yesterday evening and I had proposed that I would narrate uh, some of the, I would describe, elucidate some of the threads which could probably constitute a kind of roadmap for some of us in this kind of a chamber of commerce for the years to kind of come. Because I do not have such wonderful experiences to narrate as Mr. Mukherjee has done. I do not have such wonderful experiences which Mr. Bhattacharya has done. Mr. Bhattacharya, are you related to Shukanta Bhattacharya? Same Kotalipara Bhattacharya is no. Do you know about Kotalipara village? He was describing a village called Kotalipara of Faridpur. This is one of those very elite Brahmin dominated villages of undivided Bengal which produced some of the greatest philosophers and Sanskritic scholars of this country. Uh, I'm sure they're the same clan, but many of them say I'm not related to that part of the clan and all that. This is the clan from which Buddhadev Bhattacharya had come, our former chief minister. This is the clan from which Shukanta Bhattacharya, the famous poet, came. This is the clan from which in 16th century many of the Pajis used to come out. Many of the wonderful works on our astrology and astronomy have been written by your clansmen. And the stories that you were narrating about your father, I don't know whether you have ever narrated that, about INA and all that, have you ever given any recorded reminiscences anywhere? Fantastic stories. These make fantastic stories. So I don't have that kind of experiences and I think I should, we should congratulate them. Mr. Shane was also drawing upon a very good reservoir. Though IAS was not really created like that. I, not all ICS officers leave ICS. The, the European officers took voluntary retirement. They got huge pension. The Indian ICS officers got quick promotion. Some of them were hugely talented, like Shukumar Shen, the last ship secretary of colonial Bengal, the first ship secretary of post-independence Bengal, the first election commissioner that India had, the first election commissioner who conducted the general elections of 1952, which made India the leader of third world democratic exercises. World has never seen the kind of huge elections that were conducted in the first general elections of 1952. The entire world was impressed. Shukumar Shen was lent by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru to Sudan and many other countries to teach them how to conduct elections. So those ICS officers, Indian ICS officers were also great and they instituted a kind of successor service in IAS with Sadar Vallabhai Patel then kind of ensured that Indian constitutional disease. Pandiji did not have much faith in IAS. He hated ICS, IAS kind of officers. He thought they're all bogus. You would need generalists. So some experimentation in those years with generalists, some experiences with specialists, together finally kept the All India Services in the Indian constitution. So, but your experience has been an extremely important. My specific proposal is Number one, Bengal Chamber of Commerce today has taken a very significant lead by starting discourses on decolonization. Decolonization can be seen from personal reminiscences, political history writing, etc., which you have done, but probably your core strength and expertise will lie in thinking about decolonization of India and probably Bengal, since we are here in Bengal, decolonization of India and Bengal, probably you will be better placed to learn about in the world of trade, commerce and industries. 
in which case probably like the other parts of decolonization exercise, probably we cannot delink that exercise, especially in this part of the country, from partition. Partition must not be forgotten. Partition had devastated Bengal. Very few people remember consciously that in 1947, if Bengal was X, on 14th of August 1947, if Bengal in area and population terms if were X and Y, the area and population became one third of X and one third of Y on 16th of August. This huge fragmentation, this slicing of Bengal in two parts and West Bengal becoming a tiny non-major part of that once major industrial economy that undivided Bengal wards had ruined Bengal. All the communication channels that ran from east to west were severed, disconnected. Jute mills were here, jute, the, the, the fields where jute would be, would, be, would be manufactured was in East Bengal. West Bengal had the industries, East Bengal had the market and raw materials. Hence radicalism, hence sickness of industries, hence flight of capital from Bengal. Unless our conscious thinking regarding all those ruptures, all those <coughs> fragmentations inform all our decolonization discourses today, we will not be able to overcome those cancerous effects of those days. Hence, my proposal one is, in case Bengal Chamber of Commerce, which has such a fantastic research team and such excellent and splendid officers like Shubha and Shoma, etc., if they could focus some of their energy and attention to understand the actual specific losses that partition has caused to Bengal economy. There has been no such study. Which rail routes have been disconnected? Which road routes have been disconnected? Which river routes have been disconnected? Which canal routes have been disconnected? This, is, this was an integrated organically common economy that we had in Eastern India. The rupture has caused two bodies suddenly disjuncted from each other and one body cannot survive unless the two bodies have some kind of understanding and organic integration, not in a political sense, but in a common economy sense, in a European sense, unless we do that, Bengal economy will not fully recover. So, as I was saying, proposal one, in case BCCI wants to take this decolonization exercise further, then probably a study could be <coughs> generated highlighting and focusing on how Bengal economy was functioning on 14th August 1947 and how in terms of communication reconnects, in terms of trade reconnects, in terms of river reconnects, in terms of rail route reconnects, in terms of road route re reconnects, we can go back to that day, not in a political or statist sense, of course that is not within our agenda, that cannot be within our agenda, but in a common economy European sense, not in a day or two, but in a long term sense. We should at least know what have been our losses to understand what can again be attempted to be regained. Taking that as point of departure as point one, I'll move over to point two, which is in specific senses, in what ways the economy of West Bengal and the economy of Bangladesh today, which we all know is growing in a fantastic pace, but there are other specialists who can throw light on that. In garments and all that, I'm told they're fabulous. The same garment industry <coughs> development in Bangladesh, which is 
which is striking us with its pace, brilliance, rhythm, can happen in Bengal too. But what are the difference? The same handicraftsmen, the same organic growth in agriculture, the same inter-networking between cultivation, artisanship, and tradesmanship that has taken the garments industry of Bangladesh today to international heights can be replicated in this side also because for 500 years at least, it was all the same economy. It was just, this, it was the same common economy, the same cultural, economic, political strengths and weaknesses. There are ways and ways to reconnect West Bengal's imperatives with Bangladesh's imperatives and to learn from each other's strengths and weaknesses. Same things can be done in case of book trade, book publication, film publication, generally cultural economy, generally knowledge economy, generally communications economy. We can probably request Bengal Chamber of Commerce, point number two, to think how Bengal can convert its challenge into an opportunity by becoming a metropolis, not only for Eastern India, but for probably this part of the whole Asian continent, so that these borders which have hitherto hamstrung us, borders with Nepal, borders with Bhutan, but most importantly borders with Bangladesh, can become, instead of challenging liminalities, opening frontiers in the globalizing economic sense. Specific studies have been done by Mr. Dashgupta himself, his agency in association with Bengal Chamber of Commerce only, where he has actually shown a little broad basing of such studies could probably enable us to strategize better to think how a common economy in this globalizing phase of our national economic development can reinstall Bengal in an extremely important vantage position. And point number three would be to take a point, to take this argument further. Probably Bengal Chamber of Commerce with its historic strength, with its historic prestige, and with its historic character and mandate can evolve into a forum for the entire diaspora that has its roots in Bengal. The linguistic diaspora and the origin diaspora, whosoever has a root in Bengal, but diasporically now spread all across the world, need a point where their economic thinking of course, cultural thinking also, but today we are talking principally about economy, can be integrated and a help desk and a research cell kind of a thing in Bengal Chamber of Commerce could probably be a good seed point to initiate Bengal's global diasporic integral efforts in those ways. So I summarize by saying that for me personally, Today's session has been extremely enlightening in the sense that we have relearned that courage, fearlessness, patriotism, and values are important. And in a specific sense, therefore, we are tempted, I argue, to think that specific diasporic, continental, and two-country integral economic common market-oriented approach could probably be thought of if we all work together in the premises of this August chamber. Thank you very much. So just for a few minutes to the question answer session, I would also like to ask Alapunda, Mr. Bandupadhyay, that my mother's side comes from Foridpur, Dulali. So because of that, do I also inherit some good things of Kotali Pada, if not Bhattacharya, <laughs> but <laughs> Uh, a question first to uh, Mr. Bondupadha is that in terms of, because since we started the discussion with nationalism, patriotism, 
and he touched upon that point and particularly I also do feel agree with him that patriotism is definitely a kind of a spiritual upliftment also. But referring to Shuhash Bush and other leaders when they actually fought against the colonialism, was that more triggered by patriotism or an anti-imperialism? Ambodish is a student of Ramakrishna mission, so am I. So let me quote from Sri Ramakrishna. Ambodish is right. To a degree, nationalism can be limiting. Even Sri Ramakrishna, whose disciple Swami Vivekananda was the monk patriot and fountain head of much of spiritual Indian nationalism, had his doubts about nationalistic overthinking. I will quote in Bangla from Sri Ramakrishna Kathamrita, which is gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Those of you who do not understand Bangla, for them I shall translate also. He says, Amar jini, Sri Ramakrishna says, Amar jinish, Amar jinish bole, shei shakol jinish ke bhalo nam maya, shabai ke bhalo nam doya. In other words, Sri Ramakrishna says, it's my thing, my thing, this kind of a love is maya, whereas philanthropic, altruistic love is doya. Shudhu desher logguli ke bhalobashi ennam maya. I love only people of my country, this is narrow maya. Shab desher log ke bhalobasha, shab dharmen loke der bhalobasha, eti doya theke hai, bhokti theke hai. Loving people of all countries, people of all religions, that is the greatest love, that is Daya, etc. So I agree that from Sri Ramakrishna to Tagore, everyone would say that finally we must love the entire humanity. I'm just saying, in the name of such greatest virtues, we should not probably underestimate the lower ranks of hierarchy. I love myself. In ascending order, I love my family. In ascending order, I love my neighborhood. In ascending order, I love my district. In ascending order, I love my state. In ascending order, I love my country. In ascending order, I love my humanity. What's wrong in accepting that there could be an ascension of my self-extension? By trying to be <coughs> internationalist, and by suddenly taking out the nation part and highlighting the dysfunctional effects of loving only one country, probably many of us over the years have not realized the wonderful sides of patriotism either. Patriotism, without being zingoistic or over-nationalistic, can lead people to do wonderful things. During anti-colonial days, those things come forward. But even when there is no fierce anti-colonialism, people can generally love, as they love their neighborhood, their district, their club, their relatives, their friends, they can love a conception of their own country also. Even Tagore has done that in those wonderful days of 1905 when in two months' time, he wrote 35 songs, out of which two are national anthems for two great countries, India and Bangladesh, and another is the fountainhead of the national anthem of Sri Lanka. Only in two months, he had written songs which even today, billions of Indians, certainly all Bengalis, and even those who do not understand Bengali, they get inspiration from. So taking out that one patriotic layer may not be necessary, even while, of course, we should always highlight the deficiencies of capitalism-driven, colonialism-driven, zingoism-driven, aggressive, violent nationalism. Thank you. Moving to all of the, your last words. On. Well, I think, um, uh, Mr. Bandhavadhyaya, I have answered all uh, the question already. 
You took uh, the point of undivided Bengal. Is it possible? What is my comments on this? From trade commerce then. From the perspective of trade and commerce. Yes. Yeah, all right. Uh, firstly, I uh, would say that politically he has already commented. <coughs> it's not the part of the discussion. It's trade and commerce and maybe culture, maybe spiritualism in many ways. I think Bengal and East Bengal and West Bengal, which is now Bangladesh and Bengal, they were meant to be one. <clears throat> they are meant to be one by association of the number of years that they have been together. Unfortunately, uh, you are right, Mr. Bandhubhata, when you say that whatever people might say, you can learn a lot, take a lot from patriotism. Absolutely right. Unfortunately, patriotism is mixed up with minds of many people as dogmatic nationalism. <laughs> And that is something that we have to be very careful about in today's world, like it or not, globalization or not. If we are dogmatically nationalist, I think that is not going to bring in any benefit to any country. So, coming back to these two Bengals, we must say that Bengal is a little weak now. Uh, Eastern region is weak, Bengal is a little weak in uh, industry and trade. I think this weakness will vanish as quickly like a magician if we can bring these two Bengal together in economy and trade. Bengal, uh, Bangladesh, today's Bangladesh, as you have seen, has done wonder. I think 80% of the jeans worn by US people are all made in um, Bangladesh. I have visited them repeatedly a number of times and I have seen this factory. It needs a lot of changes, but even without the changes, they are doing wonders. So, in the last point is that if we can make the communication well between the two countries, and by communication I mean verbal communication, communication by road, communication by rail, communication by particularly the waterways. If we can make that right, and if we can somehow control the people who are in the field of, what I said, dogmatic nationalism, if we can somehow overcome them, then I'm sure this will bring a new era, a new age, after 75 years of independence now, it will bring a new era, a new age in the trade and economy, trade, economy and industry of both the Bengals, East Bengal, which is Bangladesh, and West Bengal, which is the Bengal, really. And uh, that will be a great thing for India. India, as a country, will benefit if one part of it uh, benefits, where it becomes much larger, much better in all respects. So this is, as he, as he rightly said, this is a long, has to be a long-term thing. It cannot be done tomorrow. but. If it can be done any time, the posterity will definitely be benefited by it. Thank you, all of the. Particularly, we all know the textile and the weaving industry, which was completely decimated by the British, and how Bangladesh thereafter has picked up the RMG, and definitely such unification could be one major upheaval to the economy. Uh, Mr. Shen, few last words. For you. Uh, yes, having said this, I just like to share. One small story that I was traveling once, and uh, I had a, I had a co-passenger from Bangladesh in the flight, and we were talking about our relationship between India and Bangladesh, and what he told me that day is gives me some some uh, concern and thoughts. He said India is like a multi-story building, and next to our, next to that we are like a small uh, shed. So we do expect that India and India multi story building will dominate the uh, uh, small shed and its environment. Now this brings me to the same position that we need to build trust. This is one of the concerns. And if we do not build this trust, then we cannot become together again. And meaning that in terms of trade and commerce and economy, I'm not talking politically, but then 
For that also, we need to build trust. That's my view, and uh, I also agree with uh, what uh, Alvin Bowie and Al Alok said, that together we become much stronger. And Bangladesh, being, even as being a small country, has shown what is possible. Well, on this matter, I think, uh, you know, while the idea is definitely laudable and uh, definitely the benefits that come from synergy of the two parts of this uh, is definitely something we can, one can realize. It will be good for everybody. But there could be imponderables, imponderables in the sense that Bangladesh today is a separate nation. It's a sovereign nation. West Bengal is not. It's a state. So how does a state of West Bengal get uh, merged, or how does a nation get merged with a state? Those could yeah. be yeah. difficult. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, no. I'm a friend of his, I cannot speak of <laughs> no, no. No, no, I, I'm Please, really I'm just saying, no, <laughs> this will be hugely mis misunderstood. There could be media also. We were talking about possible common working of two economies obviously as navigated by government of India. In fact, government of India has taken over the years some wonderful steps like BBI and Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal Treaty and all that. Obviously, external affairs is government of India subject and obviously there will be constraints and challenges to the extent possible like Europe things together despite national sovereignties of all the nations, some model could be worked upon. Yeah, no, no, I, is of I mean, that was a slip of tongue. Let, <laughs> me, <laughs> me, let me withdraw that. I didn't mean that. What I wanted to mean is that status-wise, these two are different. Status-wise? Not really. I'm sorry for yeah. crudely interrupting you. Very sorry. What we were trying to say, maybe we did not get time to, Government of India also thinks that the eastern side has become, as Mr. Mukherjee was saying, a bit challenged. In order to remove those challenges, we have to look east, it was said 25 years back. We have to work with east, in east here means East Asia, the Far Eastern countries, Nepal, Bhutan and Bangladesh and the increasing cooperation that India and that side of Asia have been developing only in the prism of that long durée, long historical policy evolution of government of India that we were tempted to think that if there was a knowledge desk here locally in Bengal also, then probably many viable policy alternatives could be thrown Obviously, the principal stakeholder is government of India, but we from the states also could probably throw important inputs to the national government. Yes. In no other sense can, especially our government servants, say yeah. anything else. No, no, that part is absolutely fine. I mean, there is no doubt about it. It will have a lot of value. I think let me just touch upon the other question that uh, you had asked because I should be able to deal with that better than this one. Uh, you see, basically, as far as the PSUs are concerned, we had a phase uh, towards the later part of, you know, when the Navaratna, Maharatna, Miniratna things happened, of empowering the PSUs. And through empowerment, they gained a lot of value. I think that process has somewhere got a little bit diluted. We had very effective boards. It was, these are all board managed companies and the CB, LODR rules were completely applicable in case of PSUs. When Coal India got listed, we had seven independent directors, all of them very independent and very strong. I think before we think of <clears throat> further divestment, that model has to come back. We must empower, we must bring in the, the ethos and the governance <coughs> of uh, listed companies in, the, in a very strict sense. We should avoid having politicians in the board. I mean, that, is, that has become quite commonplace these days. Unless those things are done, I think we are actually unable to realize the value of the PSUs. You see, when I retired in 2011, out of the first top 10 PSUs, top 10 companies in the listed category, I think four were PSUs in BSC. Today, I don't think other than SBI anybody was, is there. At one point of time in 2011, Coal India for 
about a week or so became the most valuable company in the country, beating Reliance. And today, where is Reliance market cap? And where is any of the pieces? So I think, uh, first of all, we need to bring back the drivers of value creation in the PSU before we think of further digestment. Thank you. I think with this, we come to the end of the panel session and the talk by Mr. Bandupada also. I would also like to take this suggestion up of Alapunda on, and maybe Bengal Chamber, you can think in that line that this could be just the starting and therefore like we follow the pastel, politics, economics, social, technology, environmental and legal, so in six dimensions we can have six such discourses like from the India in 75 years, so that could be definitely one such series which we can have. And of course, Bengal Chamber has done a lot of work in terms of this Bengal-Bangladesh joint trade and connectivities. And that could also be further expanded in terms of all the logistical border line, border points and connectivities and how that can really put India as a major player in the ASEAN economy with Bengal-Bangladesh trading enhancing. So these are the two definitely very good takeaways. I thank all the panelists and of course, uh, Alapunda very much for such an interesting session. And at the end, I must say just to quote Mr. Martin Luther King when he made his famous I Have a Dream speech, he mentioned that I dream of a country where every individual will have a dream. So we also dream of a country where every Indian will have a dream, a dream about his own life as well as a dream about the country also. Thank you very much. Thank you, BCCI, for giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, we would request our guest of honor, our moderator and eminent panelists to be on the dais. We have a small concluding song and a small uh, closing ceremony. So we would take two minutes to set up. In the meantime, I would like to thank the members of the chamber who have come forward and have helped us in curating such a memorable evening. We would like to thank our partners who have been part of this journey. I would like to thank our chief patron, JIS, Educational Initiatives. I would like to thank Decalogue Communications. I would like to thank Hermes Voyages and Six Baliganj Place, and of course, Victor Moses and Company for coming forward and helping us in setting up this wonderful initiative. I would request the choir from our Bengal Chamber team to come up for the concluding song.
so much with this we would like to invite our president sri abraham stefano sir to be on the stage and mr gautam rai to be on the stage to hand over the mementos and also would request mr obhijit das of harmers voyages to be up on the dais for handovering of the mementos to our guest of honor and panelists and moderators sir We request Gautam sir to hand over the memento to Indrajit sir.
Thank you so much. With this, we conclude our today's evening. Thank you for joining us.